nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Well, welcome everybody. Um, glad you could come and see this. Um, you'll find that while I go through this presentation, there's elements that you've already learned if you watch the other um, parts of the series on lithography and plasma etching and that kind of thing. So I'm going to do a broad stroke and try to tie it all together in a way of how a, a pressure sensor is actually made. And this is a very simple one but it, it involves a lot of different um, elements in it and it kind of brings it all together. So this is how we teach fabrication at the university. And we also teach our undergraduate research uh, students from the two-year schools, the same thing. And also we do professional development for, um, for faculty that don't know much about fabricating things. They may teach a MEMS course, but have never been in a clean room. So this is a golden opportunity for those sorts of folks as well. So I'm with the um, Support Center for Microsystems Education. We used to be called the Southwest Center for Microsystems Education. And we started our NSF Center back in 2004. So we must be doing something right. They keep giving us money and, um, and people are learning. So that's the most important thing. So we want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for funding us over all these years. And, uh, you know, and hopefully we'll keep going for a few more years. Um, I'd like to keep this thing going until I retire, um, at least that long. So anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. So some of you may not know what a pressure sensor is um, and a micro pressure sensor. We all deal with pressure and, you know, we hear it on the news with the, the weather report and all of that. But pressure sensors are everywhere now. And it's one of the first types of MEMS devices developed. And it goes back, I think, to the 60s, late 60s. There's a company called Coolite that started all this pressure sensor stuff. So it's one of the the oldest MEMS devices um, on the market. So MEMS, um, as Bob was trying to um, say, is micro electromechanical systems. So it's really small stuff that has some kind of electronic component in it. And usually things move in, to some degree. So a big part of the MEMS industry is in sensors. So sensors take an environmental input and turn it into an electrical signal, right? And if you can make them small, then they're cheap, and if they're cheap, you can put them in everything, okay? So for a pressure sensor, we're gonna convert a pressure difference into an electrical signal. And this is for like atmospheric type of pressures is what we're gonna be, be looking at with our sensor. So why, why do we care about pressure sensors? Well, it's a big market. There's lots of applications, right? You can have a lot of fun with some of these, um, these widgets that measure pressure, and you can teach a lot of things if you're an educator as well around pressure. So lots of physics and then converting you know, these signals into electrical signals, and you can teach electronics. You can teach a lot of things around the pressure sensor concept. So why do we care? It's a huge market. So this is from Yole Development Group. It's an excellent resource to try to see what markets are out there and who's doing what. And they have a lot of free stuff. You know, they do summary reports and stuff they provide for free. So it's perfect for educators. And then if you're in the industry, of course, you buy their, their roadmaps and all of their detailed stuff. And that's where they make their money to sell selling roadmaps and things to industry people. But you can see here the compounded annual growth rate is on the order of 4% or so. Um, there was a little dip because of COVID, like with all the industries, but it's still a huge market. And you can see, you know, um, where these markets are. Um, big chunk of it's in automotive. Um, a big chunk is in, in consumer and a lot of industrial applications. Also medical, right? They measure different kinds of pressure in the medical industry. So, you know, they have sensors and in intravenous delivery systems that look at back pressure so they can, they can see what's going on in terms of the flow and all of that. And defense and aerospace actually started the business of, of pressure sensors. That's how Coolite started. They needed a pressure sensor they could put on the surface of a wing that goes at supersonic speeds because you can't have anything sticking up from the wing, wing 
you know, when you're going that fast, because it just gets shredded. So how do you, how do I know what the profile of pressures are on a wing at supersonic speed? So Kulai came up with a flat pressure sensor that that could sit on the surface. And they made it out of, you know, semiconductor kind of processes, you know, small electronic processes. So they have a nice history and they, they have some stuff on their website that's good to read. So who makes these things? Well, Kulite's only 1% now. <laughs> the big player is Bosch. Bosch has gotten got into the MEMS industry and mostly for automotive originally, um, automotive applications. So they make all kinds of MEMS products and sensors. So they're the big ones. Uh, but Honeywell is up there and Amphenol and NXP that, that used to be Philips Semiconductors. Um, Sensata, I have no idea who they are. Infineon, I've heard of. So you can see here that there's a lot of players. There's a lot of market space for people. And they're always looking for the next greatest, uh, you know, disruptive technology to take over the world. So, um, you know, the future is very bright for pressure sensors um, as well. Um, Bosch, you know, I did a little research the last few days to see what's going on right now. And Bosch has got a beautiful website um, on their MEMS devices, and they talk about their pressure sensors. And I stole this from their website, and the link's here for you if you want to play around. But what I thought was cool is they have pressure sensors that go in the cell phones, and Bosch makes these as well as other companies. And the whole reason you might say, why do I need a pressure sensor in my cell phone? You know, who cares? Well, you can, you can tap into that pressure sensor and know, you know, what the pressure is, but then you can use it for internal navigation in a building. So if I walk into a building, right, my cell phone knows where I am in X and Y coordinates, right? Google Maps and all that. And then I have an inertial sensor that's in my phone. So if I lose my GPS signal, it can still track where you are by your motion, right? And then it knows what the air pressure is when you walk into the building. If you go up, that air pressure will change. So it'll know what floor you're on. So from a commercial application, that's really cool because if you go in a mall or someplace and you're walking around, you know, they can track you. And then the signs in the mall can say, hi, Matt, you know, we got a sale on shoes. We noticed you were looking at shoes last week on, on Google or on Amazon. And we have those shoes you were looking at. I mean, that's creepy, you know, but it's very possible to do that. But the way Bosch sells this is, oh, if you pass out or, or you call 911, then the, the folks coming um, to find you can find you readily because they know what what um, floor you're on. So they're, they're pitching it as like a, um, a safety device, which it is as well. Okay. So, you know, it, take it for what it's worth, but, you know, pressure sensors can be used for all sorts of stuff, right? Now, I really want to point this out. This is a very cool app. It's called Sensor Kinetics. You can download it for free on your phone. If you pay the pay for the pro version, then you can actually export data. So that's that's the hook, right? Um, but you don't have to. It's it's a few bucks. Um, but what this app does is it taps into all of your MEMS devices on your phone, so you can see what the MEMS devices are doing. So if you look at the accelerometer. It's a three axis accelerometer, at least on my phone. So I can look at X, Y, and Z motion and get the G forces in all three directions. So it's so much fun to play with. But with regard to the pressure sensor, I can tap into the pressure sensor part of the app and it'll give me the pressure of where I'm at. If I take my phone and put it on a table and then take the pressure reading, and then I put it on the floor and take a pressure reading, and zoom in on the graph, you can see where the pressure goes up when I put it on the floor. And you can get the millibar difference between tabletop and on the floor. So then you go online, you say, okay, what's the altitude difference that corresponds to that small pressure change? And you'll find it's so many centimeters, right? You can do the calculation. It's great for students. And 
as a result of that, you can measure the height of, of your desk with your cell phone using the pressure sensor, which is kind of weird, but it's good to within a few centimeters, which blows my mind that it can be that accurate. Okay. So, you know, that's another fun thing, fun fact you can do um, with your, with your uh, cell phone. So I, I'm pretty sure it, ha- it works for Apple phones as well as Android. Um, but it's a, it's a fun thing. And I, whenever I tell my students on that, you know, I don't go much further than just talking about starting talking about it and they're already downloading it and playing with it in class. So it's a lot of, a lot of fun. So this is a cartoon we did many moons ago when we were first starting out, when we were the uh, Southwest Center for Microsystems Education. So basically what it shows is it shows the front and the back of the pressure sensor. So the front has, is what you see here, and that has the Wheatstone bridge circuit, right? So you got four resistors and the Wheatstone bridge, and two of them are variable. So um, if you put, put one of these circuits on top of a membrane and then you flex the membrane right you flex it those two resistors will stretch and change your resistance and as a result of the variation in resistance you can convert that into a voltage with a wheatstone bridge so that's pretty cool right so um and and so you can teach your students all about that Okay, and it's basically a strain gauge kind of problem. So it's, you know, resistance equals uh, resistivity times L over A, where L is the length of the resistor and A is the, is the cross-sectional area. So when you stretch it, the cross-sectional area gets smaller, the length gets longer, so the resistance increases. And if you hook it up right into the, in the circuit on your Wheatstone bridge, um, you can um, increase the gap voltage or the gauge voltage coming out of the Wheatstone bridge. So the voltage is directly proportional to the change in the resistance in the two legs, and then that can be correlated to a pressure difference, okay? So that's basically what that shows. Okay, so our pressure sensor is extremely simple to make. We only have two masks, right? So we have the Wheatstone bridge mask, and then we have the mask for the um, the chamber itself. And what's really cool about this process is because it's so simple, and if you have access to a clean room, you can actually teach this in, in, in a series of maybe five labs or so on regular time, you know, lab time, or you can do it all in one stretch as a, as a workshop like we do for professional development. So it's, it's a straightforward, you know, mask. You can see the mask on the right here. You've got four bond pads. They're very big so that we, because my eyes are getting bad. I've got to have big bond pads so I can get the probes on the bond pads when I'm all done making it. And then we have different flavors of um, resistors. So we have some that are 80 microns wide and some that are down to the 20 micron wide. And then we characterize that and see which ones are better with the students. Okay, so it's a two mask process. So we do front side and back side patterning. So there's something unique there. We have to align the front mask pattern to the back pattern that we've already put down. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then we have uh, several process steps we go through. So there's silicon nitride deposition. We actually have um, Arizona State University uh, Trevor out there provides us with the silicon nitride wafers since they have the capability of putting silicon lo- um, low stress silicon nitride down on wafers. So we buy the buy that from him, and that's what we start with. And we do a backside pattern to define the the chambers that are going to be opened up, um, and then we have to do a reactive ion etch of the silicon nitride. So that's another process that the students and faculty learn about. And then we go to the front of the wafer and we do the Wheatstone bridge pattern. And we use a liftoff process for that. So semiconductors, you put a metal down and then you put a photoresist pattern over it and everything that is exposed is, is etched away. And then you remove the photoresist. What we do is we put the photoresist down first and pattern that, and then we put the metal on top of the photoresist, and wherever it's open, the metal is on the surface of the silicon nitride. 
and adheres to the silicon nitride. Then we remove the photoresist and lift off all of that metal that we don't need anymore. So that's a lift off process. So that's different than semiconductors. So, you know, we do the standard pattern and etch the exposed regions, and then we do a lift off process. So you can see the students are learning different technologies, different process technologies all along the way. Every step is different. Um, and then, and then we, we learn about sputtering. We used to do evaporation, but now most people do sputtering. So we've switched to doing sputtering. And um, if you look at our educational materials, we still talk about evaporation, but it's putting metal down on top of photoresist. And, and then we have some cool pictures on the liftoff. Okay, and then here's another video that's probably not going to work either. Let's see. Matt, I, I, my, my videos are working. If you want me to share, stop sharing, I can share if you'd like me to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can go back to the, that previous one. So um, this is our, our Wheatstone bridge. So you can see the, the two um, resistors that go towards the center of the part that's going to um, bend the membrane. Those two are the uh, variable resistors. And the other two resistors are there and on the membrane as well, because there will be changes with temperature. So this is auto-correcting for temperature. That's why it's designed that way. And then now we're looking up from the backside after we've etched the chamber. Okay. And then you can put glass over the backside to seal it. And then you have a standard pressure on one side of it. And then if the external pressure changes, then the, the membrane will flex either up or down depending on the delta and the pressure, okay? So this is a basic um, Wheatstone bridge configuration, okay? And, um, and then you'll see, you can put it in a, in a dip package and wire bond it and put it into a product, right? That's the, that's the idea behind it. We've never actually done this, um, but this is what you would do with an actual MEMS device. So you can see the wire connections coming into play. We connect to the bond pads on the, on the um, chip. And, you know, in this design, we have nine pressure sensors, so you can work in some redundancy. So a silicon wafer. Okay, and then we do silicon nitride deposition. So silicon nitride acts as a hard mask for the backside etch, and it acts as a membrane for the front side. So we're using one material for two purposes. And then we do um, standard photolithography. We have a mask, right, with dark and bright areas, and we um, shine light through it. Uh, we, uh, this is a positive photoresist process. Um, we develop it. Now we do the reactive ion etching, okay? And we get rid of the silicon nitride where we don't want it and we keep it where we do want it. Those are gonna be the chambers. And then we strip the photoresist and, and clean the wafer. Now we flip it back over and we do the front side. So we um, add some lift off resist. This is one of two processes we use for this. And then we add some photoresist. That's also a positive photoresist. Okay, so what shows goes and um, what's dark remains. So in this case, we have the circuit is the chrome. And we expose the, the wafer and then we go ahead and develop it. And it, we develop the photoresist and then the LOR5B, which is underneath the photoresist, also um, develops laterally. That'll allow us to have a little step there. So when we do the, the deposition of the metal, um, it'll coat the top and the side of the, the photoresist, but we have a pathway to go underneath and do the lift off and, and remove the photoresist and the metal that's on top of it. Okay, and now we're, we have this um, wonderful Wheatstone bridge circuit on one side and the openings on the back for the chamber. Now we put it in potassium hydroxide um, anisotropic etch at about 100 degrees C, and that actually etches the crystalline silicon and makes the chambers, and then you end up with a wafer. So I think that's the end of it. All right, so um, now let's go through all those steps I talked about in like 40 seconds and uh, go through it in a little more detail. All right, so this is a really cool process. Uh, you know, I really love it because it's simple and you can learn a lot from it. So with the backside pattern, 
right? That's where we're making the holes in the, in the silicon and we're etching anisotropically to the front of the, the wafer where the silicon nitride membrane is and the Wheatstone bridge circuit is, um, we need a pattern for that. So you can see here, we, we have a, uh, a mask. This is from the mask design software. And uh, this is actually from the guy who provides us the mask. He sends a proof and then I have to approve it. And you can see the, the chambers on the back and they're different structures. So we have a square, a circle, a diamond, and an octagon. What's really cool about this, it'll all etch the same because of the way the anisotropic etching works. So that's another teaching point, right? So to, in order to do the backside pattern, right, we need to do photolithography. And then we need reactive ion etch to open up and remove the silicon nitride and open it up to the silicon underneath. So that's exposed when we do the potassium hydroxide etch later on. And when we're done making the holes in the silicon nitride, we got to remove the photoresist so we can go ahead with the next process step. Okay. So these are the process steps involved in photolithography. And if you watch the photolithography sessions, they've kind of gone through a similar thing. Basically, you got to start with a clean wafer. So, you know, you can just do a simple uh, quick dump rinse. That's what QDR stands for. And SRD means spin, rinse, dry. Usually that's good enough. Okay. And then you prepare the wafer for the photoresist by putting hexamethyl disilazane on there. And that's a, that's a monolayer process. So that's true nanotechnology at that point. Okay. And that prepares the wafer so that the photoresist will stick to it. Um, then you coat the wafer with photoresist. So you basically put some photoresist on your silicon wafer and you spin it at a certain speed and the speed determines how thick the photoresist will be as well as the viscosity of the photoresist. Okay. And we'll go through that process in detail in a moment. Uh, then we expose the, um, the, the wafer and, you know, sometimes you have to align to another layer. So that's why that's in there. And then you can adjust the dose, right? The, and we do that by adjusting the exposure time. So dose is millijoules per square centimeter, right? Um, uh, exposure time is in seconds and we can measure the intensity of the lamp at the, at the wafer surface. So we can calculate dose and time that way. And that's another thing the students learn, right? The difference between energy per, per square centimeter, intensity per square centimeter, and how to do those kind of calculations. And then once we've patterned, we'll go ahead and develop the photoresist. And that's a chemical process. Um, and there's two different ones, depending if you're using positive or negative resist. So we'll talk about that. Again, we go through the quick dump rinse and spin rinse dry. We're always doing the dishes, right? Every step of the way, quick dump rinse, spin rinse dry. Um, and then we have a nice dry wafer with a pattern on it. We can go ahead and inspect it on the microscope and we can measure the critical dimensions. That's what CDs are. And if we're happy with it, um, we can do a hard bake, okay? Which will help the photoresist stand up to the subsequent etch steps. So this is what it looks like in our clean room. So on the left, you see a solvent bench where we can do the prep work. So we, you know, if we want to use acetone to clean off the wafer, if there's anything on there, like a fingerprint or something, which there shouldn't be, but you never know with students. Um, and, and then you rinse it with some isopropyl alcohol. Alcohol is okay to put in a, in a quick dump rinse. Uh, acetone is not. Okay, so we take the, the wafer after we clean it up, we put it in the quick rinse dumper, which is in the middle here. And I'm kind of pointing it out with my cursor. Hopefully you can see that. And then after that process, we put it in the spin rinse dry, which basically spins the wafers in a boat. It applies water, which is deionized water. It's extraordinarily clean. We make our own DI water. <laughs> And then it, it pumps in some nitrogen that's slightly warm to dry the wafers. So we don't use air, we use nitrogen for that. And that helps keep everything clean. And then once the wafer is clean and ready to go, we have to put the hexamethyl disilazane on there. 
And uh, that, that's the chemical um, structure of it in the center of the page. So hex means six. So you got six methyl groups around two silicons. So that's the disyla. And then I guess the, the nitrogen makes it the zane. So, um, so you have that structure that's going to um, result in a monolayer of, uh, of a material on top of the wafer that's hydrophobic. So on the left, you see when you start with the, the wafer, it usually a bare silicon wafer will always have some native oxide on it. Um, you know, and, and uh, silicon nitride as well will we'll have some water on there. So you can see the water on top of the silicon wafer in, in this cartoon on the left. So now I've got a layer of water there. If I try to put photoresist on that, it's not going to stick. Right. So you say, oh, well, we'll just put it on a bake plate and dehydrate it. And that works great. You know, you put it on a bake plate, the water comes off. And if you're fast enough, you can go ahead and put the photoresist on. But we're not that fast. So we're going to use uh, hexamethyl disilazane and do that at the same time. So this, this gizmo on the right, this is our HMDS um, uh, vapor prime bake oven of sorts. And, you know, you can have a big oven where you can do hundreds of wafers at a time, or you can do one wafer at a time. This works really well. So we put the wafer in here. Okay. I'm moving my cursor. Hopefully you can see it. And, um, and then we hit go and the lid will close. Got to keep your fingers out because it's a stupid machine. Um, and the lid will close and, you know, the wafer is heated to hundred degrees C and then we flow some hexamethyl disilazane vapor in there, and it'll collect on the surface as you see on the right. So the heat gets rid of the water, then we flow the hexamethyl disilazane, and it, it, um, the, the molecule breaks in the middle and these silicons like to stick to the oxygens on the wafer surface. And these methyl groups with the silicon on it stick up from the surface, and those are hydrophobic. Water won't stick to that. And you can tell because you put a drop of water on the wafer and it beads up really nice in a perfect sphere. So it's a great, great way to show students the difference between hydrophilic and hydrophobic surfaces and how you can treat a surface and, and change its, its properties. Um, so another learning point, right? But now we're ready. We have a hydrophobic surface and we can apply photoresist. So this is our simple um, uh, coating system. It's a CEE coder. It's, this thing is decades old um, and it still works. I love the old equipment because you can actually fix it. Uh, it doesn't require Windows update or anything like that. And, um, you know, you put the wafer on a spin chuck here on the left, close, uh, put some photoresist on it, close the lid ramp up the, the spin to the casting speed that determines the thickness of the photoresist. When it's done spinning up, you put it on the bake plate. And the bake plate's there to um, heat the photoresist and remove the solvent that's in the photoresist. Otherwise it'll be sticky, right? And it won't work right in the exposed um, setup. And there's a lot of other in idiosyncrasies in the, uh, and the whole bake process that affects your dose and all of that, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, and then with the thicker resist, you need some rehydration time with the positive resist because it requires water in the resist to um, facilitate the reaction during the exposure process to start turning the photoresist slightly acidic wherever it, the light hits. So you need a rehydration time with, with the thicker resist. With the thin resist, it happens quickly. So that's a diffusion problem, right? How long does it take for water molecules to rehydrate the photoresist? Well, if it's really thick, right, it might take a half an hour. If it's very thin, it takes a few seconds, right? And the thicker it is, the longer it takes, but it's, a, it's an exponential kind of for, um, re, re relationship, right? Because it's a diffusion problem. So you can go into that level of detail if you want to with your students, but you don't have to. So once we got the photoresist on the wafer, we're going to pattern it. So again, here's the, the chamber pattern that I showed earlier. 
And on the left is a is a um, is a close up of part of the wafer. So what you see on the left here is a snapshot of what's on the left on the mask pattern on the right. And you can see these little marks in here. So these are alignment marks that we're going to use later to align this pattern that'll be on the back of the wafer to where we're going to put the Wheatstone bridge on the front because we need the Wheatstone bridge to be on top of those membranes that we're going to make. If we miss, nothing's going to work. Okay, so this is our Carl Zeus mask aligner. It's a, um, an MA6, BA6, which stands for mask aligner six inch. And then the BA is backside alignment. So it can do backside alignment as well, which is a really unique thing. They don't have that in semiconductors as far as I know. Okay, and so, um, you know, the wafer goes on the wafer stage here. Then the, then the mask goes on top of that. And you bring up the, the wafer to the mask. You do any alignment if, if you're going to do alignment. But in this case, this, since it's the first pattern, we're not going to align. And then we expose the wafer and we transfer the pattern on the mask to the um, photoresist. Okay. And then once we're done exposing it, we have to develop. So this is the opportunity to teach students about personal protective equipment, PPE. Right. The, in this case, we're using a positive photoresist. So we use, um, we use uh, um, a developer that dissolves the positive photoresist. It's a base solution, the developer. And then the areas that were exposed to light have become acidic with the chemical reaction of the water and the photons that hit the, the um hit the uh, photoresist. So the photons initiate the, the reaction and the water facilitates it. And you end up with, a, with an acidic area inside the photoresist. So if I put that in a base solution, we get a chemical reaction and we can um, dissolve out all of the areas of the photoresist that were hit with light. Okay, so here you see one of the students actually developing um, the wafer. I believe this, this person actually is an instructor from one of the community colleges. And so he's, uh, he's developing the wafers in this Petri dish with the developed solution. Okay. And the top picture here shows the developed station. Okay. There's a quick dump rinse on the right. There's a aspirator here. You can see part of it. So they have to aspirate the solution when they're done so that the, the base solution can go into the um, acid waste neutralization system we have. Lots of support facilities, of course, are involved when you're doing this. And you can see the wafer on the upper right here in the developed solution. And you can see that the photoresist has been developing out and it's starting to turn the, the developed solution uh, a reddish color. Um, once we're done developing, we have to stop the developing um, quickly. So we put it in the quick dump rinse, followed by the spin rinse dry. We're doing dishes again. And you'll see this theme coming over and over and over again. So once you spin rinse dry the wafers, then you can go ahead and look at them on the microscope. And here you see some students looking at it in the upper right. Um, that's one of my students taking the course this semester, and we start off by making a pressure sensor. So he's measuring the opening, um, the circle opening on the back of the wafer that he just um, um, processed. And then the picture on the left of that is, is the triangle shape. And you can see the students um, looking at um, the Wheatstone Bridge later in the process in the picture below. So they really like this, it's very interactive and they have to save all their images and whatnot for, um, for doing their lab reports. Okay, and then we can also measure the step height of the photoresist using a, a profilometer. So this is a DECTAC 8 um, and you can tell it's a, like a Windows 7 or something over here, but it still works great. We love this tool. It's kind of like the atomic force microscope. It, it gives you a profile, but it's meant for bigger structures. So this is the wafer stage that you see here. And this little tower has the stylus right at the end. And it's reminiscent of the 
of um, us old folks will know this. The um, the um, cartridge or the the needle on a record player. Okay, so you know it comes down, then the record goes around and around, and the needle goes up and down and, and creates an electronic signal that's converted into sound. Well, this thing goes up and down and converts into an electric electronic signal that shows you the topology of the surface. So, um, so we can measure, you know, we can measure step heights and, and heights of things with the profilometer. And it has limitations like all measurement tools. So we talk about that in the class as well. Okay, so here's an example on the left of a scan thing. This is the, the additional stuff is what I drew in in the PowerPoint slide. But you can see it's a very rough surface on the back of the wafer. And if you look at silicon wafers, the backsides are rough. They're not polished. Okay, there's a couple of reasons for that, um, which I can address if you have a question on it. Um, but it will just continue on. But you can see how rough it is. And then we go up and we measure the top of the photoresist. So this is right after coat and before we've even started etching. So we can determine the, the height of the photoresist, which is about 6.9 to seven microns in this case. And we're using a 10 XT photoresist um, for microchem. So if you wanna try that photoresist in your lab, feel free. Um, and then on the right is uh, the student's version of, this, of a similar scan um, where she um, took the CSV file from the deck tac, transported it into the Excel, and then did surface roughness measurements using Excel. And I like to teach the students how to take data files and then put them in another package, and then they can manipulate it any way they want. Okay, so that's a good skill for students to learn. All right. Um, so now we know how thick our photoresist is. Next step, we're happy with the pattern of the, of the chamber. We need to etch it. So we use a reactive ion etcher called a March uh, CS1701 etcher. And you can see it there. It kind of looks, we, we refer to it as like a waffle iron. Kind of looks like that. Um, so it, it has uh, mass flow controllers in it. You can flow different gases into the chamber. You provide an RF signal to the chamber to ignite the plasma. So you can have an argon plasma or you can use CF4 and oxygen mix. That's what we do for the silicon nitride etching. And um, you can adjust power and pressure and flow rates of the MFCs. And, um, you know, we have a program that works really well. Um, so you can see some of the parameters for the program. And what we do is we'll etch for five minutes and then we'll rotate the wafer 180 degrees and etch for another five minutes because this is not as uniform as we would like. Okay, so that's to improve uniformity. This photograph down here, you see Rocio on the right. She's one of my grad students and she's teaching, I think that's Marco. And this woman I think is from Ivy Tech who runs their nano program. Bob, you might remember her name. I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but they were in here this summer at our lab to do the, the professional development. So they were here a week and went through the entire process. So, um, and it's great having the grad students there because they're learning how to teach they're very enthusiastic, and we have two working side by side, along with me. I'm in there all day as well, and it's a lot of fun. So we have a great time on these um, experiments. So after the first five minutes of etching, if you look at the wafer, you can see part of the wafer is cleared and part of the wafer is not cleared. And you can tell because they are different colors in the openings. So that tells you there's a certain thickness of silicon nitride still left on the wafer. And if you leave any silicon nitride on the wafer, it's impervious to the potassium hydroxide etch. So you won't get any chambers there. So it's critical that the students understand, you know, how to inspect things and make sure it's good. Not close enough, but good. So, and the colors will tell you roughly how, how thick that silicon nitride is because it's a thin film interference effect. 
And we actually have a module on thin film interference as well. Okay, so we have to rotate the wafer 180 degrees and then etch for another five minutes and then they, they'll all be cleared out. So then I have the students uh, measure again, the step height after the etch, but before we strip the resist. So now we can see, you know, we still have this rough, rough surface here, but now this is all silicon because we've taken the silicon nitride off. And again, backside of the wafer is very rough. And then the deck tack shows a step height and then a smoother top on it, which is kind of weird. And you go, well, why is that? Well, photoresist tends to smooth things out when you spin it on. Okay. So we can measure the step height. We look at the average of this, this reading and an average of this reading. And we take the difference and we know what the average step height is in this case. And this consists of the silicon nitride plus the photoresist. But it's less photoresist because we're etching it away while we're etching the silicon nitride. So the selectivity is not very good. Okay, and that's another thing we teach students is what is selectivity? It's the ratio of the, of the etch rate of the material you want to etch to the uh, etch rate of the material you don't want to etch. So typical etch um, or selectivities are like 100 to 1, 50 to 1, that kind of thing is what you want to do in production. But in some cases, you don't have that. Okay, so um, if, we, if we take a look at, at the height after we strip the photoresist, okay, then we know how much photoresist we um, lost. All right, so this step height difference is around one to 1.2 micron. That's the thickness of our silicon nitride, which we can also measure on an interference tool. So you can look at two different kinds of metrology tools and compare them, okay? And then this shows um, one of the faculty um, professional development folks inspecting it, inspecting the wafer. And if we look at all three measurements from before etch, after etch, and after strip, we can back out what the selectivity is. So we know that we etched about 1.2 microns of silicon nitride, so that's what we want to etch. We know um, that um, we have 2.7 total after the etch. We starting with seven microns of photoresist. And then if you combine all this information, you can say, oh, we lost about five and a half microns of photoresist. We etched about 1.2 microns of, um, of silicon nitride. You take that ratio. That means your selectivity is one to five, which is a poor selectivity. So that basically means for every, every micron of silicon nitride I want to etch, I need at least five microns of photoresist to protect the areas I don't want to etch. Okay. That's where the etch selectivity number comes into play. So we're trying to teach our students how to think like process technicians and process engineers. Okay. Now the backside's etched. It looks something like this. This is an older pattern. This is not the same pattern that I showed you in the, that we currently use, but you get the idea. It's a nice picture. I like it. So you've got open areas and not open areas. And so where it's not open is the, is the silicon nitride. And where it's open, that's where you're seeing the silicon. So it's exposed to silicon when we do the potassium hydroxide and isotropic etch. Now we got to flip the wafer over and pattern the front. Okay. So we use two different um, processes for this so the students can compare and contrast. We used to use just one. So one, one pattern is what you saw in the video where we use LOR5B and AZ1518 resist. It's an older process. And then the newer process is the NLOF27 um, negative photoresist. So since one's a positive process and one's a negative process, we need two different masks depending on which photoresist we're gonna use. So I have the same, it's the same um, design but with opposite polarities, okay? So on the left, what you see is um, dark areas and light areas. Let's see, what does it say? The text is dark. So that means everything that's colored is gonna be chrome, 
Okay. So you'd say, well, that looks weird because, you know, it's, it's dark where, where I want my circuit, but I'm doing a liftoff process. Well, with um, the NLOF photoresist on the left side, that's a negative resist. So what happens is wherever the light hits, it'll remain. And where the light doesn't hit, will get developed away. So these dark areas were actually going to be open to the subsequent metal deposition. And then the opposite is true on the right side. It says that this text is clear. So that means wherever it's colored in, that's actually an open area on the mask. So all the stuff that's white is actually going to be chrome. And all the stuff that's green is going to be clear. Okay. So um, the mask on the right we use with the positive photoresist, okay? And then again, we use our Carl Seuss to do this. So we have to do backside alignment. So we have that pattern on the back of the wafer now because we etched it, we etched that pattern into the silicon nitride and it has alignment marks on it, but the alignment marks are on the back of the wafer and we're gonna align a mask to the top of the wafer. So how do you do that? Well, you need to be able to look up, right? From the bottom and find the alignment marks on the back of the wafer and make sure they align with the mask from the top. And this is what's so cool about this tool. So these are pictures of the, the alignment microscopes on underneath where the wafer is gonna be. On the bottom right here, you can see a close-up of it. And these can move in X and Y, okay? So you, you, what you do is, is you're going to put your mask in, and then you're going to look up and align the microscopes to the mask. Then you're going to not move the microscopes, and you're going to put the wafer in between the microscopes and the mask and move the wafer till it's aligned with the captured image from the, the mask that's going to be on the top side. Now you know you're aligned. And you can see the holes in, the, in the, um, the chuck where the wafer sits. So you can look up through the chuck and see the marks on the back of the wafer. So that's really cool. And you got to see it to believe it. You know, it's, it might not, you might not understand it quite yet. Um, this is a cartoon on the left here showing what happens, so what the process is. So you move your, your microscope around until you see the mark on the mask, on the front side mask that you're going to do. That's the Wheatstone Bridge mask. And now I'm going to fix that microscope. I'm not going to move it. And I'm going to take a picture of this alignment mark and save it. So that's what you see on the TV screen here. So we capture the image and then we keep it on the screen. So if you look closely here, you might be able to see like this bright box and then a bright cross. It's bright because we're looking at the mask when we took the picture. Now we've taken the picture and now we're going to put the photo or we're going to put the wafer on the stage. And that's going to be in between the microscope. And the photo mask. So now the bottom microscopes can't see the photo mask anymore, but we captured the image and we're not moving anything. We're not moving the mask. We're not moving the microscopes. The only thing we're going to move is, the, is this wafer. And we move the wafer around until we find the marks on the wafer and they line up with the captured image from the, um, from the mask. And that's what you see here on the right. Okay, you see these four little boxes that are grainy, those, that's actually the bottom of the wafer we're looking at. And we've aligned it to the cross that we captured from the mask. So now I know when I do my exposure of the front side, it's gonna match in alignment to the backside pattern. So when we etch the, the silicon wafer and create the membrane, it, the membrane's gonna be exactly where the, where the Wheatstone bridge is. And I, I hope this is making some sense. <laughs> this is what it looks like close up. So you see the four little boxes, that's from the bottom of the wafer. And then these brighter structures, there's a captured image from the mask. And I apologize for the quality of this picture. Um, it didn't quite turn out so well. And, you know, when you're taking pictures of TV screens, right, it's a raster thing. 
So it's not like computer screens that, that kind of glow. So you get those lines going, coming across. All right, we'll continue on. So um, we're going to do the liftoff process, right? So again, we've got to we've got to coat the wafer, and then we got to expose the wafer and develop it. Okay, and this is all for the front side. So the first the the first process we we talk about here is the positive photoresist process. So what shows goes. So everything clear is is going to be. Um, going to be developed away. So the Wheatstone bridge patterns you see here, okay, they're going to be opens. So when we do the subsequent metal deposition on top of the photoresist, um, where the opens are is where the metal is going to remain on the wafer. Okay. And this is called a dark field mask because it's mostly dark. All right. And then you have clear field masks because they're mostly clear. All right. So we go through the standard photoresist process, except that we're going to spin on LOR5B, soft bake it, and then spin on 1518 resist and soft bake that. And then we're going to do the exposure. And then we're going to do the develop. And what you end up with are structures, as you see on the right. This is from one of my students' uh, lab reports this semester. And you can see that you have, you know, the photoresist um, sitting on top of the LOR5B. And when you look at it under the microscope, you can actually see this, this undercut. And you can see it with these lines on the sides of the open area. So it looks like a band. You have one edge, which is the edge of the photoresist, the top of the photoresist. And then you have another edge, which is the bottom of the LOR5B. And you get this band. And you can actually measure you know, the top and the bottom, because you can see through the photoresist and get an idea of what that undercut is, okay? It went during the inspection process. And then you do a similar process with the negative photoresist, except you use the opposite mask, okay? Go through the same thing, and you can measure that from top down and determine what the retrograde profile is. So the NLOF doesn't have a step in it. It actually has a retrograde profile. And what's interesting about this photoresist is where the photons hit, it's gonna remain, right? You're gonna subsequently um, cross-link that photoresist. And the cross-linking will be dependent on how far down you go. Because the more, the more photons that hit, they get absorbed at the top more than at the bottom of the photoresist. So you get more cross-linking on top than at the bottom. And remember, in this case, it's negative. So where the, photo, where the photons hit, the photoresist will remain. So you get a retrograde profile. Okay, It's not a step, but it's kind of like almost like a golf tee. right? It kind of looks like that. And the student here has drawn something that re resembles that. And again, that allows you to deposit uh, metal on top of the photoresist and on the open areas on the wafer. And it gives you a gap for the subsequent liftoff process, the, the chemical, which happens to be acetone, to get underneath and start attacking the photoresist so you can lift it off, okay? If you had straight profiles, um, the photo uh, or the acetone would not be able to get to the photoresist because there's no open areas for that process to take place. All right, so here's a picture of the NLOF, and the bands look different because you've got this tapered kind of retrograde profile, and that's what you see on the right, a depiction that the student came up with based on, on looking at the, the, um, the image from the top down. So you can see... You know, you've got like 42 microns at the top, 37 microns at the bottom, right? So you know what the undercut is. All right. All right. So now we're at the point where we've patterned the back and etched the silicon nitride. So that's going to be the chamber. So I, I've given you a prequel to the what the chamber is going to look like after we do the... the um, potassium hydroxide etch. And then the front side is patterned with negative or positive photoresist. 
right? and the appropriate photo mask, and you'll end up with a Wheatstone bridge, okay, on the front side. And there you can also see the, the image of the membrane itself that we've etched from the bottom up. Okay, so we still got a couple more steps to go. I think we're okay on time. Um, so the next step is really fun. It's the sputter. And there's lots of stuff you can learn about sputter. And I think you guys already had something on plasma and sputtering um, in a previous uh, um, webinar. So we, we typically do chrome and gold, followed by gold, and, or we'll do nichrome. So we need chrome because chrome sticks to, to the silicon nitride surface. Gold does not, but gold sticks to chrome. So if you want a nice, pretty, you know, gold kind of structure, you have to put um, um, chrome down before the gold. And we have multiple targets in our sputter tool. You can see them on top here. I think we have five. We got three DC, two RF, and, and then we can do pulse DC as well on one of the uh, targets. So basically the process is, is um, you have to get argon ion weight or argon ions going in there. So we flow argon into the chamber. We strike a DC plasma. We bias, we do a voltage bias to the target that we want to um, deposit the material on. The target bias voltage is negative, so it attracts the argon ions, which crash into the target. It, um, those ions force some of the material to come off the target. They're ejected from the target, and they, they um, deposit onto the wafer below. So the wafer is below the targets, okay? So here you see Pascal, one of the students from Ivy Tech, now, I believe Pascal, was he from Ivy Tech? I think he was from Ivy Tech. And he's learning how to load and unload the, the sputter tool and run the tool. So they actually get to run it. They don't just watch us do it, but we coach them through the process. So here's a quick outline of the sputter process. We have to load the wafer and pump everything down. Then we open the load lock. It's like going out into space open the load lock, put the wafer into the main chamber, close the load up lock, choose the pressure or choose the, um, the recipe that we want to use, uh, get the gas flowing, strike the plasma, open the shutter, and then we start depositing material. Okay. So here you see loading the chamber. This is uh, Pallavi, uh, another of, of my grad students. Um, she's actually going to finish her PhD in the spring. Uh, she works for Dr. Jackson, who also helps with some of these um, adventures that we do for faculty development. So she's loading the wafer and demonstrating to students how to do that. She's going to put the lid on there, and then we're going to pump down the load lock. Once the load lock reaches 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6 millitor, then we open up this um, this gate valve and we can slide the wafer in. So we have a system to slide the wafer in manually, place it on a, on a chuck. And then, um, you know, we lower the handler, the wafer stays on the chuck. We bring the handler back out and then we can spin the wafer during the deposition process. So it's a uniform deposition. Okay. So inside the chamber, this is what the target looks like. I think this is a copper target. And you can see the plasma itself is a donut-shaped plasma because the targets are flat when we get them, when they're new. So you can see the density of the plasma by the way it etches the target. And then right below the target, you'll see the stage for the wafer. So the wafer sits on this rotating stage here. Okay. And it comes in, I think, through this door up on top. So it gives you an inside view. Here's Pallavi pointing to the viewport. If you look in the viewport, you can see the plasma is ignited. Okay, here's the control, computer control screen where you pick all of the parameters that run the process, flows, gases, which target you're gonna use, power for the plasma and whatnot. 
So this is what it looks like after you take the wafer out. You've deposited metal on top of photoresist, right? And this is what the NLOF process, and you can see the retrograde profile of the photoresist, and you can see the metal on top. So this was a test we did last year, I believe, and we used Thai tungsten to test it out. Um, we figured we could see that on the SEM real well. So this is a cross-sectional view of a slice through some metrology um, structures when we're doing testing. And you can see there's some chipping and all because we used a, um, a dicer to cut the wafer. So it looks a little ragged. Um, another way to do it is you can scribe the wafer and snap it, but it's a little harder to pick where you want, want the cut to be. But people do it that way as well. So we take the wafer out. We've deposited metal onto the Wheatstone Bridge um, structure that we, we built out in photoresist. And now we're going to dissolve the photoresist away and lift the metal off. So these are some images of that process. So in the upper left here, you see um, one of the, the participants. I think this was Billy actually doing this one, Billy Copley from Mintech. Um, so she's um, got the, the wafer in a bath of acetone in a, in a beaker. And then we take the beaker and we put it in a bath of water that we can turn on the um, ultrasonic. So it's kind of like those things are, that are used for cleaning jewelry, those ultrasonic baths. So we use ultrasonic a lot to clean things in semiconductors. So we have a little ultrasonic bath that we use, and this speeds up the process greatly. So it gets, it gets the acetone um, underneath the metal um, where the photoresist is, and then it, it lifts it off at a much faster rate. You can leave it sitting in the beaker just by itself, and you can see it starts to lift off in the upper right. And then the lower left here is, is an immediate step, so you can start to see the big pieces of chrome gold flaking off of the wafer. And then on the bottom right, you can actually see the Wheatstone bridges that are left behind. Remember that's the open area in the pattern where the metal can stick. And then where the metal is on top of the photoresist gets lifted away. And then we can take a look at what our Wheatstone bridge looks like. Okay, so there's always an inspection. So what do we do next? Last but not least, we're going to do a chamber etch. Okay, so remember, we patterned the back of the wafer, and hopefully the front of the wafer is aligned to the back of the wafer pattern. Now we need to etch the back of the um, um, wafer through the silicon. So we go through 525 microns of silicon uh, on a four-inch wafer to reach the front of the um, wafer, where there is silicon nitride as well. And once we get to the silicon nitride, it stops etching, okay? And it follows the 111 um, crystal plane. So you can see on the bottom right here, this is a cartoon depiction of that. Um, you know, when you do anisotropic wet etching of um, 100 oriented silicon wafers, the 111 plane doesn't etch. And the 100 plane etches very quickly. So the... The diagonal here is a 111 plane, and the bottom or the top is a 100 plane. So the 100 plane etches like 400 times faster than the 111 plane. And you keep etching until these two planes meet, or you get through the, the wafer. So you can also look at this and say, hey, I can make some nozzles too, right? If I don't have a membrane on the other side. Okay, so on the left here shows what the, what it looks like before the etch and on the right this close up picture shows after the etch so this is the diamond shape here and you can see it's etched into the wafer in a square pattern and if you look closely here in the left picture you can kind of see the different orientations but they all etched as a square and that's due to the crystal structure and the way the etchant works with the crystal structure. And on the left side here, you can see the potassium hydroxide um, bath that we put it in, okay?
and it takes about an hour or two, you know, to etch through the wafer. And it's a very violent reaction. There's lots of bubbles and it looks like, you know, Halloween cauldron kind of thing. All right. So we're done. No, we're not. We got to make chips. So that's called singulation. We used to call it dicing in industry. I used to be in industry. So, but, you know, I've heard the term singulation. So I've gone ahead and used that as well. So we've got to take the wafer and cut it up. So the way you do that is you take your wafer and you put it on this taper here, and then you put the taping frame around it and yeah, it has alignment things on it. So you line everything up so it's centered. And then you pull the tape over and then it's like a rolling pin. You smooth the tape out and you cut around the tape, you know, on, on the frame. Okay. And then you take this wafer that's now sitting on a membrane, a tape of tape mounted on a frame and you take it over to your dicing um, saw. So this is the dicing saw here. So we have one of these, which is really nice to have. So if you need wafers diced, you can ship them to me and I'll charge you lots of money and we'll dice them for you. Um, but here you see it on the, on the um, stage on the left. So we load it up on the left. It'll take it underneath to the right where the dicing saw is. And this is an actual mechanical saw. So it has a blade, right? And the blade is maybe 40 microns wide. Right. So it's not like what you use at home when you're doing wood. OK. And it's diamond encrusted epoxy kind of thing. And it spins at 30,000 RPM. And it'll take your finger off. So that's why everything's enclosed in plastic and stuff. And, you know, you can't get your fingers in there. And it has lots of water. I mean, you see this process and there's water flowing everywhere because it keeps things cool right? Because it's going so fast. You're cutting silicon, for God's sake. That's a pretty hard material. If you look at the hardness um, factors and all that, and you're using a diamond saw. So it's producing lots of heat and particles, of course, because you're pulverizing the silicon. And so all of this water flow helps keep the particles off of your wafer as you're cutting, as well as keeping everything cool and clean. Okay. So this is some close-ups of the dicing. And then once you're done dicing it, um, you can probe it, right? We have a probe station here. This is nice because it has a Michelson interferometer in it. So you can actually look at variations in height based on the reflectance and the optical path length through the interferometer. So on the right side, you can see we've applied a, a pressure difference on the back of the membrane. So it's pulling it down. And you can see the, the rings, the interference rings. So it's 500 and something, I think 532 nanometers. It's a green, um, I think it's an LED laser, right? Light we use. So since we're in air, it's still 532. So each ring is a quarter wavelength difference. So if you go from this ring to this ring, it's like 130 something nanometers if I do my math right, or a hundred and something. So you get an idea of, you know, what the actual physical um, variation is um, in the membrane. And you can see it's not, it's circular in the middle, but as it gets closer to the edges, it, it deforms because your, your boundary conditions are, your membrane's fixed at the edges of the square. So you have a membrane on a square frame, which is kind of strange, right? It's not like a drum but it's square. And then you can see, you know, the um, Wheatstone bridge is bending along with this membrane, but you see, wow, there's a phase shift here. Well, that tells you how thick the metal is. <laughs> so that's about a hundred nanometers as well. So you can see where it's dark here, it's bright here because you've got a quarter wavelength difference in path length. Okay, so that's how interference works. And here's a close-up of the probes, two of the that probes. And, um, and so, you know, this is how it's set up and the, and the light comes down, it, it hits the wafer, it reflects back up. And then you have another path here. So the light comes from the right, hits a beam splitter, half of it goes down, half of it goes straight through, hits a mirror, comes back. Hits the sample, comes back up. Those two, those two light beams go straight up into the detector. 
Okay, and then depending how much path difference this is relative to this, you get the fringes. Okay, and then the bottom left uh, image here shows one of the probes on a on one of the bond pads. Okay. All right, so I'm done with the process stuff. Um, now I'm going to offer the listeners an opportunity to come to Albuquerque, New Mexico to see the balloons <laughs> and also maybe spend some time in our lab. So we do a five day clean room pressure sensor short course, and we usually get the pressure sensor done kind of early, like in three and a half to four days. And then we can do some other stuff. So this last summer we did, we did some um, um, soft lithography, micro needle arrays and that kind of thing. So, and sometimes the students will do a, a side project. You know, they'll do etch rates on an oxide wafer or something. So, you know, we, we have some flexibility in what you can do in those five days. Um, and, you know, we also have online short courses and we've got lots of learning modules available. Um, I'm going to start updating them again, like the fifth time. And put them in uh, Canvas down the road. Um, we're going to move from Moodle to Canvas. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has, I don't know how many um, presentations on it and uh, short lectures and animations and things like that. So you can find our YouTube channel. Um, we do have a website, right? Uh, SCME-support.org. And um, you can... Um, go there and look around and, and, and I can do the office hour thing with you at any time. Um, we'll just schedule a time when I'm available. Cause that's my job is to support you using our stuff for your students. And so Matt, quick question for you. The, the, the so if I was interested in your YouTube channel, could I go to your website and then find it from there? Or what would be the, the best I way to get to these that. places? You can also, you can also do, a search on YouTube, SCME um, microfabrication or something like that. Um, yeah, and if you have trouble finding it, just shoot me an email. Um, we also have undergraduate research experiences. So we got the professional development, and we have stipends for that uh, on the order of like $3,000, and that, that helps pay for your travel and all of that, and it's for one week. And then you have to do some prep work. Always have to do some prep work before you come like understand the basics of the pressure sensor process and then complete our online safety course. And then that way we can get you in the clean room faster. If you wait till you come here, I'm going to make you sit in the classroom and do all the safety stuff before I let you in the clean room. How many technicians to like a, a faculty member? What, what's the ratio? We've done a bunch of different ones. Um, the biggest was Jared with eight students. Okay. Gotcha. And then we had, um, from Ivy Tech, we had two faculty and three students. Okay. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's like you want to have the students and the care. faculty there. Just have faculty. If you, if you want to come by yourself and you don't have students, you know, the key is if you want the stipend, you got to be teaching two-year students. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I and, and be interested in spreading the word, right? Exactly. I don't want a university research professor coming. You know, I'll let you in if you pay your own way. Mm -hmm. Get here and stuff. If I'm, if I already have a have a, a week going, because I had a fellow from Oklahoma come out. He's he's a really good MEMS guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he does research in MEMS, but he never made a MEMS device. Cool, kind of interesting. But he came and he went through the process and he goes, "Oh, now I understand so much more." And it was really good. But I didn't, I couldn't pay him because he's. You know, he, he teaches university students. So, um, but, you know, I love it. The best thing, you know, and I don't know if I'm the only one who does this. Maybe other groups do this too. But if I can get you to come with your students, it's golden. Because the students know you and they open up much faster. And then you're both learning at the same time. And, and then you can play the role of the mentor and, you know, query your students as they're learning all these processes. Um, so you can see, you know, from these photos here that there's a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion. We've got one group doing one thing over here and another group talking with one of the grad students over here, you know. So 
and, and I'm floating around taking pictures because that's what I do. I'm never in the pictures. Um, but anyway, it's no, I talk to the students all the time. So I, I have a course this semester that's a lot of fun um, for undergrads and grad students. And they they do the same kind of stuff with more detail. And I'm in the fab with them, with the TA. So, you know, I'm 16 hours a week. I'm with the students in the clean room. And that's what it takes to get them really thinking about things because I'm constantly probing them and asking them questions. And, and then they start to pick up on things. And three of them already got a job at Intel since they started the class six weeks ago. Nice. Nice. I think I'm doing something right. Yeah, there you go. All right, there are interns, and one got a permanent job, and it's like, how did you do it so fast? I go, well, we knew what a wafer was, and so we got in. <laughs> it, it, it's not quite like that, but they can articulate, hold, yes. resist, and etch, and they knew those terms, you know, because 90% of the engineers that apply out of school at Intel don't know this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. that's what micro nanotech does, right? And then we got our community. Bob and I started this craziness back in 2011 with our conference, all right, that we used to take around the country to different uh, MNT education sites. And then we formed the Minty site like three or four years ago now. So that stands for Micro Nanotechnology Education Special Interest Group. So you can find us online. It's mntesig.net and uh, sign up. There's a little sign up thing on the homepage. And then you'll get spammed whenever we have a meeting or something. So, and it's not that often, you know, because Bob Bob has to keep the lead on spamming everybody about. <laughs> I don't know. I see a me might get you, <laughs> but the, but it's really this is this is a cool group. If you do want to um, continue the learning, I, I think we've had a lot of um, partnerships, kind of you know, and and you know, uh, people help each other if you're. If you truly are working in this in this area and are educating in this area, and you want to improve. There's nothing better than than uh, you know talking to somebody else who's done it before, and then yeah. figuring out that hey, I've got a technique. Oh, I've got oh, I, I have a really great way to describe that or whatever it might be. And I think there's a it's a great group, and we also have industry connections. Uh, you know, we we're working with the the new national center. I think it's really a a a, a really a, a very good uh, good group of people, and I don't know, remember how many people now. A couple hundred, I believe, well, right? We have, we have uh, over three hundred members, and probably about forty to fifty of them are fairly active, right? Other people just get the email, right. then if they see something they like, they'll show up, right? Um, which is fine, you know. And it all started started with a balloon, right? It all started when, with a balloon. What do they call that when you I light them up at night? Balloon burn or balloon? Blow. Balloon blow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. At the conference that Bob and I were at, it was at a comms conference, and we were at Tamaye, which is a fancy resort thing um, in, north of Albuquerque. Uh, and they, they had the, the comms conference. It was about 250 people. And we're sitting there watching the balloons glow. And I guess the hot air going into the balloons got us talking because we like hot air. I think you were whispering in my ear. You're the one who came up with the idea. <laughs> I said, you know, Bob, we should have some kind of conference and get all these micro nanotech educators together, right? Because the conference we were at were mostly entrepreneurs. Yep. Right. And yep. they didn't really pay much attention to us because they were busy making deals. So, um, you know, and we're, you know, comms is good though. They're trying to keep the educational stuff going. But anyway, one other thing about Minty SIG is we have uh, working groups. So we have an industry working mm -hmm. group. We have a professional development working group that Bob and, and Jim Smith are in charge of. We have an outreach group. We have a curriculum group. Is that it? And the uh, fifth uh, uh, distance education. Oh, distance education group. Yep, yep. So if any one of those things is interesting to you, you can also get into one of those groups and they meet about once a month as well. We meet once a month as a big group and we usually start later in the, in the semester, in the, in the fall, because we're so sick and tired of each other after the summer. <laughs> <laughs> we need a break, um, but no, we're a fun group and you know, I really enjoy it. Okay. And so, I think this is the last slide. If you want to give it a shot, just reach out to me. You can call or email me. 
Uh, let's see. And there's a YouTube uh, video on the undergraduate research experience and, and what we do there. So you can show it to your students if you want, but take a look at it. I talk a lot about all the different kinds of projects that students could do when they come out here. So these are two students that came out. One, this guy's going back to school to get upgraded. This guy is just still in school. So, you know, we get all sorts of folks coming out. All right. Question, Matt, real quick. If, if people want to use some of your materials, you know, your SCME materials in their classrooms or with their students, can they do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Whatever you want. I can even give you the PowerPoints and the docs and you can shred them and reconstruct them. I do appreciate it. If you give us some credit mm -hmm. for whatever you, you use, you know, a little SCME thing or thanks to NSF or something, but that's, that's what it's for. It's for you to take and adopt, or you can use it as is. I don't care. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to teach because I always manipulate everything I steal from other people. So I have to, I have to tell you, it's great material folks. If you want to, you know, if you want to do any of this, bring any of this to your classrooms, definitely check this out, check out their website, please do. All right, folks. Well, we appreciate your attendance and we will see you next week. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pyle. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.